Good. We seem to have gotten a fair bit of feedback on your risque shorts last. What are you doing? Pumping up the footy. Welcome to the Collingwood Rant. I'm Sly. And I'm... There's only two more games till we fuck it up, Spook. Or was there one? Only one. Only one. Only one. Um... What was the qualifying final? Let's... We did that part. We qualified. Well, let's go... Let's backstep. Maybe Brayshaw should have thought about that. Yeah, I'm not going there. Uh, Let's backstep. John Noble. Drop for the game. Yep. Did you... um, How long did you party for? (laughs) I'm not a monster, I'm just ahead of the curve. <laughs> but what do you think about dropping him? He's, he's been a stalwart of the side since he was recruited. Um, it, it was a funny one. I, I, it's, I must say it surprised me. Um, you look back at his finals performances last year, and they probably weren't great. I guess there was a concern that they'd play off him or through him again, and, and that was just going to be a, a bit of a route that we didn't want to take. And... Um, Oleg, I mean, I think we've made comment that Oleg's been exceptionally good this year. Uh, bigger body, has the same sort of level of pace. Um, I think he's sort of out, not outclassed him, but um, passed him. I said it four months ago. I prefer Oleg, even though at that stage he was still just a pinch hitter. I actually really encouraged by dropping Noble, not because of any bias against Noble, but it's good to see him make a really hard call. Yeah, great. You know, and looking at the best side rather than, you know, I think sometimes sentiment creeps in and you've seen that with some grand final side or some final sides where they've gone for like favourites rather than, you know, hey, is this the side that's going to be best for us on the night? So I was actually really, really impressed with that, that they made such a hard call. I'm sorry for John Noble, but obviously you can only fit 23 players on the side. No. You uh, sort of feel like it's it's it goes back to that thing about, you know, um, we talked about it during the week with the with the trouble end, and um, you know I think it's the NFL or whatever it is that when they win a Super Bowl, everyone who contributes is more or less treated equal. And they all get a, a ring or the Super Bowl ring or what it is because they they helped yeah. the team to get there. You sort of feel in some respects, not that I'm getting ahead of ourselves or and saying we've won the flag or anything early because I think everyone did that six months ago. Um, you think there should be some form of recognition for like a bloke who's played every game, well, not only this year but the last couple of years, and has been a you know at times a, a a force into into winning games and helping the team out. That you you know come success at the end of the year, it's it's hard that he misses out, but at the same time, you know I think internally you'd be, they'd be saying, well, you, you know you're part of that journey, mate, all that sort of thing. But um, yeah, it's, it's a shame that I get some sort of recognition. But then yeah, you look at Leon, he's got a he's got a medal, he doesn't value it. No, I was going to, Matthew Lloyd says the same thing. You wouldn't want it if you didn't play on the day. And the NFL, I mean, how many players in the side? About 68 that they wheel out there between defensive sides and defensive sides and special teams. There's about like, 24 sides they play, yeah. Yeah, but in terms of like um, all, all the players in the list. No, so I mean, there's 24 sides. They yeah. rotate through a game. And the thing with um, NFL, I don't know, this could seem to be undervaluing certain players, but, you know, there's players that their whole existence is just blocking and I think well, it's on, a, on Twitter <laughs> there's no such thing as Twitter anymore on X but it's I think it's easier to feel part of that sort of system because the the, the, the main guy in NFL is the quarterback and then you get the receivers and then everyone else is just blocking um, so I think and and one guy comes out and just kicks it every now and again so I think it's a little bit easier is, is to feel the, part of that the system the massive punt is it long, is it? The a Australian, huge punt the Australian yeah. <laughs> it's usually the Australian uh, the it, funny punt it was projected to rain, and it did rain. Who do you think? Because we we're watching the press conference with Craig McRae, and he said, "When the rain came, he thought that was good for us." And actually, was oh, he one of the Beatles now? <laughs> Maybe. Um, he's all about growth. But how would you feel about like the projected rain? Because I actually thought that was going to work against us. Melbourne's got like a really big, strong midfield. Yeah, it's funny. Um, obviously, amongst your friends, and I'm sure everyone was doing it, that um, everyone was scanning the weather app every five minutes and look at the radar and the projections and all that sort of thing and trying to work out how that was going to impact us. Um, 
it, it's funny though that the G because you look at the times that it was meant to rain, even though it didn't pan out this way. I wasn't particularly perturbed going in because I thought if it's going to rain early in the night, the drainage at the G and everything's pretty good. The ground does dry out really quick, yeah. and you, and you probably think that all this worry won't have any bearing. And then you were, we were at the pub, not you and I, but um, I was at the pub beforehand, and there was a fucking monsoon you, coming uh, down. Yep. And um, we got sat just walking to the G, and you think, well, that's now suddenly got a direct bearing on 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 how the game's going to be played. But it didn't really pan out like it played like a, a wet weather game. It would have been, you know, like probably maybe 10, 20 percent, um, a little bit greasier. But they, I think they handled the conditions well. So I don't, I don't know whether it actually made that much of a difference. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, obviously the first quarter we jumped them and obliterated them. But I just thought with their bigger bodies around the ball, you know, you look at our midfielders, the only, the two big ones are the Goey and Pendlebury. And Pendlebury's not really playing that sort of role. What well, impacted him? Play. He had about four positions to three quarter time. Yeah, but you know, and, and the goalie just came back, and he looked a bit uh, tentative after the slip. Uh, and then you get like sort of the smaller mids, like Adams, uh, Mitchell, Josh Dacos. But then you get their their mids are like all bigger bodied guys, uh, and so I thought that might play against us, but it didn't actually work that way. Mm. I think one of the really important things I think in in the first quarter, Adams got seven clearances, and he gave us impetus to sort of overrun them. Later on, it uh, Mitchell was good over the course of the game, particularly in the third quarter. But as the game went on, their midfield started to dominate us, and Gorn was just a beast. I thought it was really important. And this is why I've been saying playing this rough for fucking 19 years. Cox just jumping up into Gorn's chest and, and thrusting the knee into him and just putting him down straight off. Like, I thought that really set the tempo. And oh, it's good to see a Ruckman who has that sort of aggression and welcomes it. It, it was a different Ruck contest when you had um, Darcy up against Gorn. Um, Coxy, I think, was a good match for Gorn. Has the same sort of physicality and he has a, pre- a bit of presence around him. Makes Gorn probably second guess a little bit more about what's going on around him. Um, like he was on Easy Street when Darcy was rucking against him. Well, I think him. you saw Gorn sort of wrestle Cox at times and have to actually like throw him around because he's just so big to navigate. Mm. I mean, the interesting thing I think with Cameron just in general is when they brought him, they brought him to the club as a forward. They didn't bring him to the club as a ruckman. So now they're using him as a ruckman. Uh, and obviously he's got the height and all that sort of stuff, but. You know, I always say it, Cox has the weapons to be a really good ruckman. Oh, I don't know why they don't trial him as the full time ruckman. You think it's testimony in the in the last where um, Cameron was subbed off for Ginevan, and then Coxie was left to ruck the game out on his own. I mean, at that point, though, it was there was probably ten fifteen minutes left. It's not like it's a massive duration, but um, you know, it speaks volumes. I'd I'd, I'd be entirely in the same boat just to continue with Cox. Well, um. I'm amused by Craig McRae saying that Darcy Cameron had been ill, so they had Noble on standby. Or in case he spewed and he had to hold a bucket out. Or in case Noble had to play. And it's like... On stilts? (laughs) Well, that's the thing. is That's your like-for-like replacement. (laughs) Surely that's quite a major change of balance in the side. He did say he's a little bit faster, so he's probably got the edge on him there. (laughs) Just a little bit faster, he reckons. But look, I I just found that amusing. It's, It's like if you have a Ruckman... Um, who's potentially going to go out? I would have thought they'd say, "Hey, let's bring up Kruger as the emergency, or whatever the case might be, whoever's down there in the reserves, and even if we have to play him as a sub, because you'd want like that second tall, or you know, second ruck tall." But to go to Noble, that would surely change all your plans. It means Cox would have to ruck the bulk of the game. You'd have to bring McStain to do the part-time ruck. So I actually found that really amusing that that was their their flip. Uh, four two to one goal in the first quarter. Yeah, it was a good start. Yep, and I actually thought you know Elliot missed a couple of pretty gimme shots. Yeah, that was that was odd. And sort of reminiscent of the final against Geelong last year, where we just squandered chances to really you know almost bury the game immediately. And I think that was the case now too, because you knew they're going to come at some point. In the second quarter, we only kicked one one. They kicked um one four, so they were inaccurate. Um, I know people sort of go if they kick accurately and all that then hey it would have been a different game but like I always think if you kick accurately like that one four if they kick three straight for example and I think Colin would be given a, a, a more immediate response but when they're inaccurate you sort of can play that tempo and go okay we've just got control of the game we're just on top of it at the moment we don't have to go full, fully hard 
But then the second half, um, the last, oh, so third quarter we kicked 4 1. They kicked 2 5. And it looked like every time they got a goal, we just went down and got another one back. Um, and that last quarter we kicked 2 points and they kicked 3 2. It was really reminiscent of the 2019 qualifying final against Geelong, where I have the scores here. Um, we were 7 5 at half time, kicked 2 2 in the third quarter, and then didn't kick anything in the last mm. quarter. And just sort of really controlled the match defensively. There wasn't really a, you know, the punch for punch type of game. Yeah, I still like. I was pretty angry at the time, even though you know we obviously won and all that sort of thing. I mean, there's two things that I was thinking I would have liked to have seen in that last quarter, and and I wanted them to come out and and put the game to bed quickly by kicking the first couple, and then put them to the fucking sword. Now, I know there's nothing to be gained on that sort of thing, but again, it's about statements that you make in a final. Now, you, know, you look at the way that Brisbane finished their game. You know, it was, it was toe-to-toe. Yep. And then they, you know, obviously poured out a couple of injuries and stuff. But once they destroyed them, they fucking destroyed them. And I think that sort of makes you sit back and you feel a little bit fearful of Brisbane now. Um, that, you know, it wouldn't have hurt us to do the same. And, and, and second thing is, I, I still can't for the life of me work out what their strategy was. That's not a fucking massive lead to defend. Yet we didn't look like we fucking had one interest in scoring in that quarter that no. we just would drop them yeah, back. It was actually very reminiscent of the Collingwood Long game a few weeks ago. It was very similar. Like, we got the lead, and then that last quarter, we just... I don't know. It was just like, we'll just play tempo, defend it. Um, and Geelong came at us. And, you know, what went from a comfortable game went to a bit of a frightening game. And it was just constant. Um like repelling attacks, trying to nullify what they're doing and then just kicking the ball to the wing and then just starting back over. It was like playing half court that like we had to get to the other wing and then we're going to come back and kick it their goal. Yeah, I, mean, I don't recall too many times in that last quarter where they were clearing the ball with any purpose. They were just bombing it. Yeah. And invariably you were bombing it to fucking Gorn. They're looking up the ground going, well, what's the options? Well, Gorn's over there. We'll go there. Like, I mean, obviously they were just maybe thinking that every every situation with Gorn was going to be a contest bring to ground. Then you'd burst out the back or something. That was their strategy. But I can't imagine that you would have got together at three-quarter time and said, well, explicitly, I want you to do this and play this particular way. Yeah. Because, look, it, it, it just felt like one or two goals would have broken that game. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it, it, to an extent, like, I, look at last year when we played Geelong the first time and we were five, six goals up. And then they came back and they overran us in the last quarter. And then I think we touched the ball. And it feels like there's been an overcompensation to say, well, we can't just play attacking for 100... We'll try to play attacking for 100% of the game because it leaves us open to momentum swings. So how about we just try and control the game? But I, uh, it feels like a recipe for disaster. It feels like you're just leaving yourself... Do you think prone. there's a game where that could possibly go wrong? Yeah. Um, so let me throw out some names at you. Bobby Hill. No, he was good. Very, oh, very good. He was really good. Yeah, you know, um, I mean, you love the bloke, but there are, there are games like that. It absolutely makes your heart. I can not say be true. Then what a stupid thing to fucking say. Make sure write a love um, song. It just it just makes your heart pound in in admiration um, for uh, just how good they can be when they're fucking on song. And his his performance was really good. Yeah. And I just love the way he was reading the ball coming in. You know, all the, all the running to space was awesome. That that one where he um, crumbed off the back of the pack. Yeah. Fucking, when's the last time you remember someone in a, in a Collingwood jumper doing that that effectively? Uh, Collingwood Richmond, when Moore kicked to the top of the square and Grundy roved. He kicked the winning goal. <laughs> I was halfway to the uh, train station when that happened. <laughs> <laughs> Will Hoskin Elliott. Yeah, he was fucking good. Uh, credit where credit's due. Um, he was really, really good. I just, it was, it's hard to believe you'd be saying this. Obviously, he's got his fans out there. The club loves him and all that sort of stuff. But I didn't think, at this stage, he looked like he had that sort of game in him. I think that was the best game he's ever played. I forgot the line. I think it's the best game he's ever played for the club. Yeah. It's the most consistent that he's played. I, in 2 he had some good games, but he sort of came in and out of them. I thought that was a consistently good game. Throughout, he did a, had a lot of important touches, some really good sports. Had a few important touches with uh, Viney. <laughs> yeah. Flying the flag. And we'll, uh, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Jeremy Howe. You reckon? Yeah, maybe. Is there something there to talk about? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, Jeremy Howe. No, he was good. He, um, like his last year's final series, I don't think was anything to write home about. And um, I think there was some concerns expressed during the year that um, when we talked about him in, in particular ran episodes that uh, I had some probably some doubts about whether uh, 
again, he had that sort of game in him, but um, he was exceptionally good. Yeah, I noticed he really attacked contests with purpose, and when he punched, he punched hard. It was like, this is fucking getting the fuck out of here. I don't want it around me. Uh, Josh Dacos. <laughs> He'd be one to forget, I think. He, he, he got back into it in the last quarter, but that was it. He had an absolute stinker for three quarters. Yeah, he really struggled. Slow, and, he got caught, yeah, indecisive. Yeah, does he does he play better when his brother's around? I think we'll find out. Um, well, yeah, that game when his brother was out, and then was it a Geelong game? He got thirty seven touches. Yeah, that's that's probably one in isolation. I uh, look. I, I think the wet sort of our side's actually a relatively small side. There's not a lot of beasts in there, which is sort of one thing. Like I think with Noble going out, that actually helps you get Mark off. I actually thought played a pretty good game. Hmm. Probably his best game for the year. Um, I think Josh is just a small light player, so he should never be inside mid. He just gets bustled out of it too easy. And with it being wet, I think he was just sort of... T- I don't know if he was overall, but it just felt like he just didn't have the physicality to attack the contest. Mm. And it, be- it was a really grueling contest. You know? uh, it and you was. You've got guys like Oliver and um, and Petrarca and, and you know, Viney. Well, I, mean, I know Viney's not a huge guy, but like he's bigger than Josh. Uh, I think he is. Uh, but... I think when you got the smaller guys, they too easily get bustled out. And that's been an issue with us in terms of recruiting for a while, which we've talked about. Uh, Dugowie? He was um, he was someone who needed to get into the game a bit. Like, he hit that beautiful goal. Yeah. But I thought he could have done a hell of a lot more. But he, it was this game where he, he did the split thing, the slip. He did that really. With the he, ankle he, early. He did that effectively right as yeah. Brochure was getting knocked out. It was the, the ankle one, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, um, whether that ended up having a bit of a detrimental impact. What did he finish on? It was only about 20-odd touches and a goal. Yeah, right. you know, look. Go swoop, Luke. He, he's the one that you want to see rip the game apart. He's the one they need to really stand up. Yeah. And especially if they make a grand final, he can't afford to have a game like that. He needs to be in the 3-2-1 vote getters for us to win a flag. He is, the, and I'll, I'll say this, and people will say you're being negative, but if you look at that way that game petered out, who would be your free two one in that game? Because I'd probably have Hill up there, but the other two I'd have up there would be Petrarca and Gorn. Oh, you meant across the board? Like yeah, does. Oh yeah, definitely. You know, definitely and, Gorn. And and Petrarca really came into it, uh, and I think really shows what quality means in the side. They will always stand up. And the is one of our few guys who has that elite quality. You know, Quainal was good. He's been really good the second half of the year. Um, but then you have there's a lot of really good role players. And obviously Darcy Moore is a really good player. But there's a lot of... And we've said this. We have, there's a lot of sort of scrappy role players who you know, really fight hard. But we sort of need more cream. And he offers pretty much the most cream you can get outside mm-hmm. of Nick Dacos in that side. And he really needs to have like two finals, which are just like he needs to be in the top three vote getters. Yep. Pat Lipinski. Who? He'd, um, he, look, if the side remains unchanged, let's assume, and we'll talk about it obviously, but if, let's assume Maynard gets off and you make him one change oh. this week to bring in Nick, it'd have to be Lipinski. Lipinski. Yeah. I can't see who else it would be. He's just. Unless they drop Josh Dacos. He's just got no presence at the moment. He's a shade of what he was yeah, I, providing I, last year. I think he had a bit more, a better game against Geelong where he played a bit more as a mid. He's sort of playing as a high half forward type, but he's really, yeah, struggling to impact the game. Um, uh, and what about Jack Ginnivan coming on the last about 17 minutes? <sighs> it, it, it fired the crowd up. That's probably really about it. He, well, yeah, that he, one really he brought, tackle. Yeah, he, he brought some pressure to it in the in the end, but he, look, I mean, it's hard to come on at that stage as a you know as a bloke you still probably consider a forward and have an impact. What did he end up playing? It was he was around the wing and stuff, wasn't he? he was yeah. sort of chasing the ball. Um, look, yeah, I think for you can't be too harsh, but you know, look for seventeen minutes, he did what was required, I guess. Yeah, look, I, I he did the tackle. He applied some good pressure. That fucking duck. I mean, yeah, that, and that's that only was... clearly ducked, and that was just I thought irresponsible at that time. It was unnecessary. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we were close to moving the ball inside fifty. Could have been the one and only fucking time we scored. Yeah, and that was just he really played for it, and I think this year, particularly since he's been back, he hasn't really played for him. 
Um, he's been legitimately hit high, but that one was one you genuinely played for. Yeah, and look, the chances of him actually getting them now are pretty slim. So there's and no point he actually realise that too. Doing that action now, it's actually counterproductive. Yeah, so I was actually really disappointed in that. Would have, I'd like him to go away in the off season and just sort of go, okay, what are the other fucking weapons I'm going to develop? Yeah, I can't duck, um, and I want to develop a reputation as just a sort of hard play at the ball always playing the ball always playing the contest so umpires after a while will change your perception and go okay if he gets hit high it's because he was hit high yeah. it's because he ducked oh, that's a good point uh, any players that you want to address that I've potentially missed out on um, the only one that, that I can think of was um, Darcy Moore he's, he's yeah. again, he'd been out of it for what three weeks three games yeah. whatever he was rusty as all fuck at the start I mean how many times did he fucking kick into the the player on the mark. It would have been twice. I've got no idea. Yeah, the kicking was, you know, he just seemed like he was doing most of the fucking kick-ins, whether it went out of bounds or he was always putting his hand up say, I'll, I'll fucking do it and, and not doing a great job of it. But, you know, the good thing is out of that, 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 that blitzkrieg that came in the last quarter that Melbourne just kept pushing forward, geez, that helped play him back into some form. I yeah. think his last quarter was really good. And that, you know... It, not that you wish that situation on on him to be under that much pressure, but I think it fucking really revamped his um his return. It, it ended up being a productive thing. I'll throw another guy out there, out there Dan McStay. Kicked his mandatory two goals. He, oh, look, he was I thought remarkably, um, what's the right word? Just a, a non presence, and then he he came into it and he did some vital things which were awesome. But for someone of his size, I'd really like for opponents to be treading tentatively when they're around, you know, when they're around him. But it's like when who's, Van... Who's Van, standing him, though? Oh, fuck, I don't know. Van, was it Lever or...? Oh, I don't know. It would have been Lever or May points. Was, you reckon that might have been the instruction was get these two marking targets up forward and use him as a decoy? I don't get know. them out? I know my check was dragging his away at times. But it's like that one where Van Ruin elbowed him. And I just couldn't imagine Lee Brown or, or Anthony Rocker being in that situation. I imagine that Van Bruin would have ended up on the ground because they would have just said, I'm just going to run straight for you. Uh, and I just wish for his size and bulk, he had a bit more presence. Yeah. I have no idea about what, what the instruction was. Mm. Uh, I want to really point out the fucking umpiring. So, I mean, in the first about 90 seconds, they had two holding the balls that weren't paid and they paid that one to the only hill. T- only two? Oh, no, I'm saying in the first 90 seconds. Only two? Yeah. Um, the day got Swinery is... Called holding the ball. I mean, he fucking got tackled the moment he got it, pretty much. Brayshaw took out Adam's legs in the opening minutes. No free. Cox took out Petrarca's legs. That was a free. McCreary went for mark of the year, missed it. It was an unrealistic attempt. Both Pickett and Fritch went for mark of the year. I got nowhere near it. <laughs> that was fine. And there was a lot of decisions. I know Melbourne got some rough ones too. But watching some of the games this week, like fucking the bad umpiring, how much it impacted the outcome of games. I mean, Sydney got railroaded by Carlton. Oh, sorry, not by the umpiring game, the Carlton game. In the um, in the GWS St Kilda game, when St Kilda were coming at him, bloody Lockie Whitfield fucking threw the ball. Was, wasn't called anything. The umpiring is so fucking bad and the yeah. AFL do there's, nothing about there's it. There's only four of them around these contests. They can't see everything. It's not, that, it's not the umpire's fault, I don't think. It's the AFL's fault because there's no concrete interpretation on anything. So this gets to the other point. The Braden Maynard thing. Before you go on to the Maynard one, and I can't remember who it was. I think Coxie was involved. But there was there was one where there was a kicking in danger. It was like any other day it would have been well, a kicking in danger. basically kicked it out of Cox's hands. Yeah, and then fucking Cox was done for tunnelling or something. And yeah. they ended up with a free. Yeah. How the fuck he won he... the ball. That was the one. He took out the legs. That's what I'm saying. It's fucking ridiculous. And, and I see, like, I remember, there was only other games where the same sort of thing happened. And they said, oh, that's a free... To the guy who had his legs taken out. No, no, it was a free to the guy who took his legs out because he was hit high. And it's that, and whichever I knew, it's that fucking murky era. So when do you take the legs out and when is it you've been hit too high? And now you go into the Maynard one, the which is by the time people see this, everyone's disgusted ad nauseum. You get fucking Maynard bumping or ultimately bumping um, Brayshaw. And everyone's up in arms. And it's like, well, you know what the fucking problem is? No one knows what the rules are. So no one can actually tell us, well, definitively, 
is this a football act? Is it an accident? Or is it a malicious and then he gets weeks? And people will draw on precedent like the, the Patrick Cripps one last year. But no one knows. Because you see like this year's sling tackles. Some people go, go out for weeks. Like the Carlton player, I can't remember who it was, but he got reprieved. Um, you get fucking bumps. So if this guy goes, that guy doesn't go. And you look at them all, I, we don't understand what the fucking rationale, rationale is. Because the AFL has no templates in place to say, this is what's illegal and that's what's fine. Everything is judged on a case-by-case basis. And doing that, they're just making it up as they go along. And a lot of time, they're just fucking responding to public opinion. Yeah, I, I, the thing that, and obviously, there'll be a little bit of bias creeping in here, but the one that's really fucking standing out to me with the main art one is it's the second that everyone gets their hands on that fucking slowdown footage, that becomes the narrative. Like, when you watch it at full speed, you got fucking what a half a second to make a decision in that but when you're looking at it um slowed down everyone can sit there and talk about it for fucking 10 minutes as it goes through frame frame and it makes it look like you've had 28 fucking alternatives that you could have gone and and chosen at that moment rather than the one that that ended up being the one that happened it it just makes it a a mockery really about the way these things are assessed Kane Collins had a really good point oh not a really good point he just insisted when he was talking about it on the football show on Sunday he just goes I don't want to see it slowed down I don't want to see it slowed frame by frame spot on played in real time and then the thing too is, and I don't think anyone's fucking posed this, why is the onus on Maynard? Why isn't the onus on Brayshaw to get the fuck out of the way? <laughs> so where's, why has no one discussed that? Well, Brayshaw deviated a little bit in the way... He, he, he actually goes into it. And well, the thing is, I mean, we're all physics experts, according to X, Collingham supporters now, but to bring physics into it, if you're running forward, you've got momentum, you've leapt in the air to spoil... There's no fucking power on Earth unless you're from Krypton at this point that's going to stop your, 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 the direction you're going. All he could do at the end was like what he's done. He's like, oh, I'm going to fucking um, protect hit. yourself. And I think that's a reflex reaction that you move. You know, I think no matter what, if he'd just done that and still smacked into to Glass Brayshaw, he, um, he would have probably been gone. Now, the boy's got a history of concussion. I don't think for these ones it takes much. like with... Um, Murphy, it doesn't seem to take much to, no, to he, knock him he's out. He's taking dives all the time, apparently. Yeah, well, so yeah, it, it, it's it's look. I, I don't think it should have been cited. Well, Ma- uh, Michael Christian didn't want to cite, and that's because he's biased. And that, that bias really came out to play when he suspended Taylor Adams and, you know, for the fucking oh, yeah, tackle. That, and... Yeah, the fucking narrative that he had. Oh, which jumper did he uh, used to wear? I mean, fucking hell, how many times has he has he suspended our players? It's like fucking when people have a five-second memory. I, I don't th- think he's demonstrated any bias towards his old club at any point. No, not at all. It's really moronic. It's like when fucking, and, you know, we might talk about the pre Brian Taylor voted for Nick Dacos to win the Anzac Day medal. And okay, people go, oh, he's biased. Even though the fucking Taylor's votes matched like two other people, <laughs> but Taylor's biased. What about the other? Fu- the, the the thing that fucking just shits you is, is like you bring up X, and I saw one fucking moron go, "Well, Maynard's guilty because if you look at him, he jumps forward. He didn't jump up. He jumped forward. Well, that's because he's fucking running, <laughs> and that is physics. It brings you forward. And again, go back to the onus. Why is why didn't Brayshaw get out of the way? If Maynard had enough. Um, capacity to get out of the way while he's in midair. Well, Brayshaw's feet were on the ground. Why didn't he get out of the way? Well, that's it. He's, physics works for him in terms of being evasive at that point. And he's then, got traction. And then people say, well, he's running, he just kicked it. Well, if he can't fucking change his route, why should may not be able to while he's in midair? It, it's encouraging to an extent that you get fucking people like Kane Corns, Adam Ranaskis, like Adam Ramanaskis, former Essendon player. He mentioned it too. He goes, like, I thought the tribunal was for acts of malice, and there's no malice in that. Um, so you're getting players coming out like Campbell Brown really came out and just said fuck it you know it's, it's an accident Jonathan Brown said it all so you get a lot of players who are coming out just going shit happens um, but of course the experts on X who have never fucking played a game in their lives they know better uh, you get a few people who are sort of against the narrative I mean, at, uh, so Joel Selwood sort of said he thinks he's in trouble I think that was malicious from Selwood I think he was just saying the way the environment is he's probably in trouble um, oh, I think everyone's worried about that part, and that—that's what I. And even people like Gary Lyon, who sort of come out against uh, Maynard, I think they're still saying the same thing. It, it's, it's you know, it's the environment that's the fucking problem. But the reality is, and people are saying this in the comments that we, you know, in the Facebook post and Twitter post, if that's suspendable, then 
why wasn't the fucking I mean the one you brought this up immediately why wasn't Blank from Hawthorne suspended for breaking Nick Dacos' kneecap oh that's it you, you, you've maliciously run into him you've cracked his knee he's out for six weeks yep. and nothing to fucking answer for and then you get ones like why aren't people who like go for mark of the year and put the knee to someone's head and knock them out why, aren't, why isn't that suspendable why isn't anything that causes an accident suspendable regardless of what the action was if you want to just fucking penalise the outcome then the game's fucked you'll get players that go I can't attack the contest because I might actually hurt someone well, you look back, and I, I fucking can't remember the name of the Geelong suck who hit um, Cameron, uh, the redhead. Rowan. Rowan, Gary Rowan. Um, that's an accident. And look, but we argued at the time that, you know, you, if, if everything is measured by the outcome, he should have gone for fucking well, three exactly plus right. weeks. So, uh, and the thing is, like, I, I, I wasn't looking downfield when it happened. I remember watching Maynard hit, and the second I could see that um, Brayshaw wasn't getting up, your first thought was, this, oh, he's fucked. Because as soon as they can cast, that's it. You've already predetermined that there's an outcome there to answer for. But then when you watch the the full replay on the screen, you're going, fucking hell, there's just nothing you could have done. That is just, in every definition of the word, an accident. I don't think Maynard at any point, and he's been marked for this, has gone in there with the intent of fucking laying him out. No. He saw that he's kicking the ball forward. He goes, well, fucking, it's obvious he's going to kick it over my head. I'll jump and spoil at it. Well, this is the... He broke free from his... He left his fucking opponent to, to try yeah, and, to, and to spoil that. Yeah. And this is how stupid people are and fuck, I don't give a fuck you the fucker insult. I can't remember who the journalist was, but someone said, well, that's what happens, you know, it's a smother and all that. And someone goes, whoa, it doesn't happen in other smothers. And it's like, you don't get a lot of smothers which are contextually like the one Maynard where he's run off his opponent, full pace, at the at racial leapt to try and smother him. Yeah. I mean, usually the smother is you're right there and the guys try to come in and smother it. So you can't fucking compare it to like every smother. And this is how ridiculous people are. They make these really broad comparisons. They draw these insane parallels and it's like, you got to fucking judge it in isolation and say, and this should be a benchmark case for the AFL. They need to fucking, come, and I know they won't do it, they need to come out and say, you know what, sometimes shit happens. We've been saying that for years. Years. Sometimes shit happens. You cannot fucking stop it. But every time there's an injury, it's like um, the broken leg where they fucking they change a the sliding or they brought in the sliding rule. The moment there's an injury, it's like, well, that's not a good look for the game. Let's fucking bring in a rule against it. And you get fucking these athletes who are 80, 90, 100 kilos running full tilted at one another. Guess what? Sometimes they're going to fucking accidentally hurt each other. Mm. If you want to penalize them anytime there's an accident because there's a, the outcome, as you said, then you should have done like the Gary Rowan should have got six weeks for knocking out Cameron. It, it comes back to like the, the whole argument with all this stuff is the head is sacrosanct now. You can't fucking go anywhere near the head. Unless, of course, you're Van Royen and you deliberately elbow someone yeah. in the head and that's only weighted as a, as a penalty for a week. Even though Maynard hasn't been charged or anything like that, the recommendation is three plus weeks for an accident. Yeah. You would have thought that the one actually where you deliberately and you're willingly knowing that you're about to clip someone in the in the um, in the chin is the one that would be the worst of the two. It just doesn't make a lot of fucking sense. But the AFL is the same. Yeah. No one knows what the rules are because the AFL fucking changes the landscape constantly to just address whatever the fuck they want to address. And then you get ones like the Patrick Cripps one last year where he was originally suspended, but then it was overturned. And it's like, well, why was that one? Um, what, you know, why did he fucking win an acquittal there? We don't know because no one actually knows what the fuck is going on because nothing is constant in this competition. And that goes across the board. For, and I always say the AFL stands for nothing. They're a really shit organisation. So you get things like third-party deals, and we know who we're fucking talking about. They're fine on that hand, but they're not fine on this hand because it doesn't... It's like when Gary Ablett was going to leave Geelong. Geelong got him the third-party deal, and the AFL goes, no, no, you can't do that. But we know there was other players who went to clubs on third-party deals. You get fucking um, really unequal fixtures. You get bloody free kicks, which change from quarter to quarter. A lot of them, not just like one the umpires missed. The fucking umpires are right there the bulk of the time. Mm. They just aren't... Pay- but no one knows what it is because nothing in the AFL is fixed. And people do what the fuck they want because no one knows what the rules are. They're not inflexible. They're just things that are re- reviewed after the indiscretion or after fucking something's happened. And it's frustrating. It's a really shitly run competition. And I'll point at like numbers. I'll look at the numbers. We'll go, it's the fucking golden goose. How could you possibly fuck up football if you're running it? Oh, let's play some games on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Oh, look, it's a success. 
good job. You really grew the fucking game. And you're going to run them into the ground when you bring in the Tasmanian team now as you did fuck when you brought in Suns and, and Giants and have a compromised competition for the next 10 years. It's a really badly run competition and that is all the way across the board. There is nothing they run well, I think, in the competition. No. Except the ineptitude. They run that really fucking yeah. well. What do, you, what do you think will happen? I think he'll get off. I think he'll be cleared. I think... I, I, the one thing I wish... I, I don't know what's happening behind the scenes at Collingwood. I wish, though, particularly with Jeff Brown being a lawyer, who should know all the loopholes and, and strategies and all that. But I wish a little peep came out of Collingwood just saying Collingwood's prepared to go challenge us in court. And for AFL to hear that and just go, okay, is that the route we want to take? Are we going to fucking... You, you, you'd figure if, you had, if it ended up in court, you'd, you'd imagine you'd successfully argue it away. I think it would. I it mean, shouldn't have to get to that point, though. No, no, but that's not I wouldn't actually do it, but I, I wish something like that was starting to be heard around Collingwood. So the AFL said, no, they're not going to let us fucking make a, a scapegoat of, of Maynard in this if we suspend him because we want to look good for the fucking Auskick parents who are watching the game and thinking, I don't want my children going to this game because if it's, if it's this rough. But I'm hearing from Colin, but they're going to fucking push this all the way. Yeah. Then maybe we need to back off also and just say, well... But you and I back off. No. But right. they, you know... Uh, so I wish like there was murmurings coming from Collingwood just saying, we'll fucking no. take this as far as you want to go. Because the whole AFL game, it, it, the competition's based on the fucking conceit. Like, you can't have salary caps and shit because it's all restraints of trade. So if anyone ever went and challenged, they'd all fall apart. So it's all based on this handshake agreement that we're all going to operate within these fucking rules and these parameters. If someone really wants to push it, they could totally break it. And I think I wish the Collingwood sort of came out a little bit harder and, and maybe they're doing it. Maybe we're just not hearing it, you know? Well, they've started out in the right route. They've got a King's Council in um, to, to yeah. look at the case. They've Isn't got the a, one? a biomechanic expert. They've even got Neil deGrasse Tyson to, to come out and work out the physics of it all. You know, he loves Collingwood, but uh, I'm, I think he's going to shelve his bias for this one. Is the biomechanics expert the same one who built Steve Austin? Yeah, that was yeah, bio, bio, it's good, isn't it? Bionic mechanics. Um, yeah, I think it was. It was Rudy. Rudy oh, Wells. Looking Rudy for his Wells. Name. That's yeah. it, yeah. Yeah, what do you think will happen? Um, that this will drag on for two weeks. It'll distract us. We lose the flag and he's rubbed out for two weeks. Yeah, I, I think this will be a signpost. I mean, we talked about this earlier if this goes well for us then I think it's you know, I don't want to say fucking signs you know mean we're going to win it and all that sort of shit but you do need a lot of things to go right so if this goes right then it's like okay maybe this can be something greater for the fucking club this year uh, if you look at the the finals that went so Sydney's out St Kilda's out um, Carlton Melbourne who do you think will win out Melbourne's missing like bloody Brayshaw and <laughs> Van Ruin will miss I would like to. Out I, a few I, weeks ago. I would like to think the D's. I mean, they they'll come out even though they're they're crippled uh, by two players being absent. They'll come out absolutely wanting to atone for last week. I think it should galvanise them enough to win. Carlton only just fell over the line against Sydney. They started really well, but Sydney fucking reeled them back in. And I think Sydney probably were the more deserving winners on the night. They got shafted. Oh, two, goal reviews, two goal reviews and some dodgy hardly. frees. Yep. Um, Carlton, you know, well, you know, history will say that they won, but I think Sydney were the... Well, Carlton's uh, missing McKay. Yeah, and uh, Jack Martin. It's been Jack, right so Jack Martin, yeah, Jack Martin's been... So he'll get off, because obviously they they said they're going to contest that, so he'll get a written apology and a bonus. <laughs> um, so they'll only be missing McKay. And, uh, but, but I mean, it's Carlton. They'll rewrite the concussion protocols this week, won't they? Well, I, the McKay thing I actually think helps them because they were doing really well when he wasn't there. Because if the whole year when McKay and Kurnow were there, they couldn't work out a balance of how those two operated. And then McKay got injured and then Kurnow just fucking blitzed, like being the sole key forward. So McKay being out I actually think helps them. I don't know. I mean, you've got May and Lever. I mean, they will both... But... They'll both be able to contain Kerno, you'd think. Kerno's a fucking freak. He is, but it makes it a little more difficult if you're not having to stand the, the, the really other interesting thing is, uh, right, so I think Melbourne lost to Carlton a few weeks ago, but that, Melbourne, that was when they experimented with bringing Grundy back as a forward. <laughs> he might come back now. Yeah, surely they wouldn't, because they... Well, really he can't like, come in as a forward. And Ben Brown, I believe, is he injured or something? 
Well, not, doing, not fully recovered, or is he just... I thought he was doing carrot top impersonations. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know where fuck. Did he go back to North? Uh, <laughs> what, what would you... Well, he's got his premiership at North. Does he leave something in his locker? <laughs> he's carrot top. <laughs> yeah, but they surely couldn't bring Grundy back. I'd be looking at it going, look, Gorn's said it all the time. He's a fucking freak as a ruckman. Yeah. Why you would get anyone to take any ruck time off him? He's playing there as much as possible. So he'll, if he gets to play the ruck full time, he'll obliterate anyone who's there. And that's no disrespect to the Carlton ruckman. That's just, that's how good Gorn is. But the the midfield battle is real interesting because, you know, they both got real beastly midfields who really love the contested ball. When's it been played? It's that day, is it, it's the Saturday Friday, night? Or it's Friday, Friday, Friday night, is it? Yeah. Yeah. No daytime games. Is that a thing? Yeah. Oh, well, if it's um, if it's a nice day, Friday and, and everything, then I think the D is definitely. Yeah, I'm actually going to go for Carlton. Uh, suck. So Brisbane smash Port. Port's fucking kicking a goal early. It's pretty laughable. It, it, these people are getting paid hundreds of thousands to miss the whole goal face from 15, 20 metres out. That's embarrassing. Uh, Brisbane looked really, really fucking good. GWS looked good against St Kilda. GWS has done a really good rallying job this year under Kingsley. Yeah, they have. Well, well they, they won eight in a row or something there. Well, oh, i got no idea. I don't know. Who but they... Who gives a fuck, really? <laughs> uh, Kingsley was like second in line for the job at Collingwood. Yeah. So he's really showing his credentials. Like this? Yeah, like a comp. King. Uh, so, Kingsley. who's your tip for that one? Who would you rather play in the prelim? Um, who's playing GWS again? GWS Port. Well, I think the easier route would be GWS if they can they can roll Port. But I think we'll be playing Port. And I don't think that'll be as an easy game as we think. But I, we, we should account for either one of them. Ah, uh, look, I, I just, we, you know, said it. I can't remember when I said it, but it, it's. This constant fear at Collingwood of, hey, hopefully this plays out for the opposition. Hopefully this happens for us. So we get, you know, just fucking smash whoever's there. Yeah. Coincidentally, our two best wins were against these two teams, GWS and, and Port. And both those wins were at the MCG. You know, we smashed Port by 12 goals and GWS by about 10 goals. If GWS is to win through, that would be after they've gone to Melbourne, to South Australia, and then have to come back to Melbourne. And Port's gone from. Brisbane to Brisbane they'll be back at home but then they'll have to come, come to out, Melbourne yeah. you know and you'd think that's pretty tiring as it is and, but you know even with all things being equal you'd think geez come on if we're the premiership favourite you should do it easy you should do it easy and you should do it emphatically um, I'd really like to yeah, I really thought with the Melbourne game I remember about the first quarter and a half I said okay let's just fucking have a nice easy game and ultimately it probably was an easy game in terms of you know, it wasn't a come from behind win, or it wasn't a holding on to a two point lead for fucking a quarter or whatever, or trading the lead back and forth. But it was harder than it needed to be, I think. Yeah, that's a good. And point. as you said, that you know, if they kicked one or two early, that would have just killed the game. Yep. Uh, so I'd like to just think that whoever we play, we smash. You'd hope so. Conversely, though, if if it's not too much trouble and we do win, if Dunny Hare and, and Cameron can collide hard enough to break each other's legs, then I'd go into grand final day feeling a bit more confident. Well, I mean, don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but Brisbane look really fucking good. Yeah. And they've got a really... Danaher's had his best season at Brisbane and probably like his best season for his career. And then you get, like, Cameron's a fucking gun. Hipwood's good enough to be troublesome and... You know, you get that. They got a really good midfield. They got some really, you know, Lorena's not really good forward. So, it's just call us the Brisbane rant. Uh, and despite the raft of excuses, we, we couldn't beat them twice this year. That that always concerns me. If we go up against someone that we haven't been able to beat, yeah, it's it's a bit of a worry. If you, I mean, we'll jump on the gun, but if you play Brisbane, they got two tall key forwards, and we got one tall key defender, and then either Howe or Murphy would have to play. Above there or punch above their way. All right, let's not just let's not go no, there. No, no, they jump so, ahead. Yeah. yeah so, uh, yeah, GWS Port. You tipped Port. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think they'll do it comfortably. 
on their home deck as well. I'm going to go for GWS. Oh, good on you. I think just with... they got nothing to lose. Total underdogs. I thought they were fucking really good. I think actually one ironic thing, and I remember the first time Hogan played in the preseason game for Melbourne, and I just looked at him and thought, this guy really fucking has the goods. Um, and I was just shattered because it's like, oh, fuck, he's ended up at Melbourne. And then he had off-field troubles and Melbourne got rid of him. But I think that's ironic because if Melbourne still had him, <laughs> they'd be really fucking good. Yeah. He's a really He's good... had a good year. Yeah. And that Jake Riccardi, he's had a good year for um, GWS too. Pity we didn't draft him. There was all that talk we were going to go after him. Yeah. Yeah, you know, his family expected us to draft him, didn't they? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who did we take instead? I don't know. Oh, fuck. Who knows? Any final thoughts? Uh, no, it was good to win. Good to be straight in the prelim. A um, little bit concerned. I don't know how it's going to go, but yeah, the fact that we've only played one game in the last two months because of these buys and stuff. Um, look, there's no excuses. You know, we've put ourselves in the absolute prime box seat pole position, every other superlative to describe it, um, to have a fair fucking crack at this thing. Well, you'd have to look at it like by the time the prelim came around in that month of football would be two wins and zero losses. You'd take that, wouldn't I you? I would have taken that. I would have taken that. that yeah. Anyway, that is it from us. And that is it from us. See you a couple of weeks. Yes, yes, in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Well, we just keep having time off. Yeah, cool. For good behaviour. Maybe we should go away. Yep. Later. See ya.